Um, let's see. We're going to start with an intro here, um, and we'll introduce the people on the panel. Um, we're going to talk about um, the MSNBC.com project uh, and sort of how it came together and kind of a top-level overview and, and maybe get into some of the uh, technical details of it. But, uh, um, but mostly we're kind of talking about the sort of business end of things and the decision-making and sort of the high-level sort of how stuff came together. But we're happy to talk about whatever aspects of it you'd like. Uh, and we'll have a big question and answer period at the end. Um, but I suppose if people have questions uh, during, you could raise your hand and we'll, we'll try and accommodate them. But, but we are mo mostly sort of focusing on uh, questions have to go to the mic. Um, this is all being recorded and posted on YouTube. Um, and so if you don't speak into the microphone, you don't exist. Google will not know who you are if you don't talk into the microphone. Um, so I'm Jeff Robbins. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of Lullabot. Um, Lullabot sort of took a tech lead p position on this on this project, um, and uh, mostly I'm 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 here sort of as the rube. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm resenting uh, pres uh, the, the representing the everyman um, and going to ask questions as if I don't know the answers because um, I don't know the answers to most of the questions. Anyways, um, uh, but I'll let people here introduce themselves on the panel. Uh, I'm Richard Wolf. I'm executive editor of MSNBC.com. Um, so my role was to put impossible demands on all of the developers and um, run for cover. <laughs> my name is Karen Stevenson. I'm with Lullabot. I'm uh, the architect for the site and. Uh, my role was to run for cover. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm John Keegan. <clears throat> My title is VP of Technology Strategy at uh, NBC News Technology Group, uh, and I uh, herded the cats for of technology for MSNBC.com and continue to uh, uh, manage the technology for that site in our uh, highly matrixed organization. So, so Karen, do you want to you want to explain sort of how the title of this presentation came together? Yeah, we, we decided we wanted to do uh, a presentation about the MSNBC project. It's a, it's a great project, and we had a lot of fun doing it, and it was really exciting. And we're trying to figure out um, what to title it. And one of the things that came up as we were going through the project, we had, all, we had all these kind of impossible things to do. We had a kind of a crazy deadline. We had a huge team of people. We had a lot of things that were going to be very difficult and that were, quote, impossible. And... Um, Richard uh, always had this quote. We would talk to him. He talked about the fact, well, he'd say, well, you know, we do live TV. He said, we do the impossible every day. And so the, everybody just sort of picked up on that. And, and every time we had something come up that we had to do, everybody say, oh, yes, we do the impossible every day. And it just sort of became a mantra for the project. And so that's where the, the, where the impossible came from for the title of the program. So um, we created a... a sort of a case study video uh, kind of thing that I'm going to show now. Uh, MSNBC. Oh. Sorry about that, folks. I didn't see that. <laughs> but it's a prime yeah. desktop system. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. One more time here. MSNBC started life about 17 years ago, and it was, in the mid-90s, a vision where TV and digital would all converge and it would all be great. MSNBC on TV had come to mean something very different, a place where, as we like to say, we lean forward. On digital, this thing called MSNBC.com had continued to trundle along with the original intent which was to be a sort of 24-hour version of NBC News. And there was this disparity between the two. So we unwound what was left of the joint venture that created MSNBC.com. We renamed that NBCNews.com. And then we were left as MSNBC to create something wholly new. Here at NBC News, we talk a lot about the newsroom of the future. The concept of a story has really evolved. We all knew what a story was. It was it had a headline, it had a lead, maybe there was a related image. Today, we're creating new content types that allow us to tell these stories that we weren't able to do five years ago, let's say. 
We know that our audience is consuming us in multiple spaces at a time and place of their choosing on any device that they own. We know what MSNBC represents. We have a clear sense of mission. We know how to create the content. As a publisher, I think you have to not say, how do we do what we do? Is how do we translate what we do into this new medium? The scope of this project was very large. There's this company out there that you might have heard of called Facebook. We tried to build Facebook and a brand new news site all within the space of nine months. We had a lot of discussion with uh, you guys at Lullabot and with our designers right from the beginning about responsive design, about mobile first. We are creating all this content and it should be in a form that can be distributed anywhere. I think what we ended up with, it's immersive. It feels great in all of these different spaces. And it allows this organic path for you, whether you want to stay just on the content side, whether you want to move into this more of a community space. We felt that it was important to make the social network part of our news. That's not just sticking a button on a piece of content and saying, tweet from here. It was really embedding every piece of the community. Users had profile pages, group functionality. It's not the journalist organization that matters. It's how the user organizes all of the stuff that we're producing, and they do it on their own. We have a, a very large editorial team. We have a separate team for video. We also have a design team. There's a kind of level of complexity and increasing sophistication that's required on the back end to allow editorial teams to build these new types of content in a way that won't slow them down. And that works? They're happy with it? Oh, they love it. When you really get to the crunch, you want a team of developers that say, set us the highest challenge we have. We want to reach for that extra piece of, of what we can do rather than just repackaging what we've done before. Very early on in the project, I could see that the Lullabot team had said, you know what, I think we're working on something unique. They really opened their mind to the fact that we were building something brand new. It was a monumental undertaking, and to do that in nine months on the kind of budget we had, uh, was really extraordinary. We knew that there might be multiple points of failure across the board, but Lullabot would not be one of them. The most amazing thing about this launch was that it was so anticlimactic. The very first day when we went live, uh, there was uh, you know, some excitement and, uh, and, and some clapping, uh, but it worked, because really there's only one thing that's supposed to happen, is it's just supposed to work, and people are supposed to go and create the news now. I'm not just saying this. It's been the most fulfilling. It's not just my, my comment. My senior team has told me it's been the most fulfilling professional experience of their entire careers, and it's not often you can say that. Um, so, Richard, why don't you talk to us sort of about kind of the history of uh, MSNBC and sort of kind of, I don't know, the past 10 to 12 years that sort of led up to uh, the business decisions that, that came about to making this site? Sure. Um, so uh, I, I kind of – you heard a little brief version of the story just on that video, but um, back in 96, 97 um, – Microsoft and NBC, that's the MS and the NBC, for those of you who don't know. Um, they got together and they did a, um, you'd have to take my word for it, they did an extraordinary thing, which was to sign a 99-year deal. A 99-year deal, because that's how committed they were um, to this idea of what they called convergence back in the, in the 90s. And... Um, and it was a 50-50 joint venture. So in addition to having this very, very long-term marriage, they also decided that there would be no casting vote, which was all wonderful in the 90s bubble. But convergence took a little bit longer than they thought. And then finally, when we got to the point of convergence, um, the two sides didn't exactly get on. 
Uh, we had bought out, we, NBC, had bought out Microsoft on the TV side um, about eight years ago now. And the digital side was still trundling along in this 50-50 joint venture. And as MSNBC grew to have a bigger profile and a bigger voice, everyone realized on, on all sides within the joint venture at Microsoft and certainly NBC that the website had become detached from the bigger brand, the TV brand. There was a dispute about which was the bigger brand and not, but uh, we ended up saying, this isn't working. Let's go our separate ways on the digital side. So we reshuffled things around, took the old portal site, handed that over to NBC News so that they could carry on with that mission, that um, you know, sort of 24-hour news mission, and, and we could build this thing from scratch. And that really was the mission impossible, which was to... Um, to create something out of nothing in a very, very short space of time. You all are familiar with, obviously, creating things from scratch. But when you've got a big media brand um, that has a tremendously high profile, you've got very, very impatient journalists who are you know, suffering from ADD every single second of the day. They don't understand why you can't just flip a switch and create this spectacular thing that does everything and pleases every stakeholder. And there are a lot of stakeholders in a big media company. And so uh, and everyone wanted it immediately. We had nothing. We had no website. We had no digital presence. We, and the digital presence that existed didn't really reflect us. So it, it, it was wildly ambitious, still is, uh, on a ridiculously short time frame. Uh, we, we had people who, senior people who to this day don't understand why you can't just create one, something like this in three weeks, four weeks. Um, so there was a long educational journey we all had to take. Does that answer the question? I think so, yeah. And for those of you who don't know MSNBC, for a start, I don't know what you're doing, but... Uh, <laughs> We, uh, we, we, we say we lean forward. We obviously cover a lot of politics. We cover it from a broadly progressive perspective. Our audience, super engaged, uh, very passionate about the brand. Um, they identify themselves as MSNBC people. I mean, that's, that's a, we wanted to make a statement with this, not just that we could build this thing from nothing, but that it would look different, it would operate differently, it would really embed with a community because the community already existed. We weren't trying to create that out of nothing. It existed on lots of different platforms in lots of different spaces. So I will stop there. <laughs> so let's talk a, a little bit about uh, MSNBC.com and sort of the decisions that were made about that. John, do you want to sort of chime in and, and talk about um, things like the decision to use Drupal and sort of how, how that sort of trajectory started for MSNBC.com? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll start with that one. That's a great uh, – that's a great question. Uh, our friends here uh, uh, at uh, a group uh, at NBCU called ONTS are here. Uh, the the great thing about our company, uh, about NBCU as a whole, is that uh, uh, that there's a lot of support behind Drupal uh, uh, across the organization. We have a strong team, a central uh, uh, kind of technology team that is dedicated to Drupal and has a couple years, three years maybe, uh, uh, behind the program. And uh, uh, so there is kind of an infrastructure and a support system around uh, uh, Drupal, uh, both in terms of development as well as uh, uh, the hosting of it. Uh, so it was kind of uh, 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 a no-brainer as, uh, uh, as far as choosing Drupal. Uh, the company already had the support behind that. So uh, really, at that point, uh, we had a content management system, but... Um, the site, as you can see, really uh, is not just about uh, the content management system. We kind of thought of uh, the three legs uh, of our uh, of our platform were uh, the content management system in in terms of Drupal, uh, also uh, our video uh, and our video experience, uh, and and of course the technology required to create that, and then the technology required to create the community uh, and social services, which. Uh, I guess as a technology architect, I was very lucky that we happened to have this group 
uh, that was part of the original MSNBC.com, uh, and that was a company called Newsvine, uh, and I don't know uh, uh, how many Newsvine users are, are in here, but they uh, they were kind of uh, pursuing this kind of community news space uh, uh, since around the mid-2000s, I think. They were acquired by the MSNBC.com uh, uh, joint venture in, I want to say, 2007-ish, and uh, a group of really talented developers uh, that we chose to partner with in building the uh, community and social tools. So, uh, so those were the three kind of technology stacks that we had to integrate to create this platform. What, what was your plan around um, uh, mobile and s- s- what it ended up being responsive and stuff? Was that a, your, your trajectory originally, or how did that end up coming? Well, about? we had a lot, of t- uh, dis- a lot of discussions about it. Uh, uh, there's obviously. Uh, you know, obviously, the the whole concept of responsive design was uh, preeminent in everyone's minds. Uh, there's also a school of thought that um, I think for sophisticated publishers, uh, CNBC is an example uh, uh, that uses an approach where they they build very customized templates uh, and serve content. Uh, based on user agents. So so their philosophy was that uh, uh, if you can build these separate experiences, you should. Um, and we chose that uh, for, I guess, really for our, uh, uh, not only for the technology and the user experience, but also for the timeline, it would be a, a smarter decision to uh, to go with a responsive approach. A part of that for us as well was was starting from absolutely zero. We had no apps. We we had no presence anywhere, and we just couldn't roll out everything together. So responsive was a was a neat solution. I will say, and, and we touched on this in the video, um, there, there were some interesting and long and passionate discussions uh, with a Lullabot team about. Um, were our designers really mobile first? Were they, was was it just was it mobile optimized? What what was this thing? And and I'll be honest with you, we fudged it. Um, and I actually think fudging it was the right the right choice to make in terms of the design, because I see um, sites today, new sites that are really perfectly mobile first <coughs> and in the desktop experience which still accounts for the bulk of our audience it's unreadable i mean they are hideous hideous things so um yeah you you can break things down to have great mobile experiences and 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 that's really really important so i'm not trying to minimize the importance of of the mobile audience at all that's clearly where all the growth is and where all of our audiences migrating to at a, at a fairly rapid pace. But right now, uh, whatever it is, middle of the day, East Coast, um, about 80% of our traffic is coming through desktop laptop. And, and if we had taken the approach that some other publishers had had with this you know, strictly ideologically pure mobile-first <laughs> approach, I think we'd have really been in trouble because um, there's no hierarchy. There's no the hierarchy is is all um, resolved by the breakpoints. So I think from a design point point of view, we we flipped it around. Some pages we went desktop first. Some of them we went um, mobile first. And I'd prefer to think of our design being mobile optimized rather than mobile first. I I think this was really interesting because this was kind of one of the early big areas of discussion in this project was <coughs> how are we going to handle this? Um, what, what does this really mean? And I, I think what was important was that we kept bringing back to everybody's mind that what we cared about is whatever we do, it has to work across everything. And that is, the end of the day was whatever we do has to work across everything. So uh, let's get into the, the stack. We have a slide here that, um, funny enough, people on the panel won't be able to see. <laughs> so I'll describe it for people on the panel while people in the audience are able to see it and those of you on YouTube are cozying up with it. Um, uh, so so let's talk sort of about the, the stack. I'll just sort of list off kind of uh, um, what – What's part of it here? Maybe I'll sort of turn it towards. No, John can't see it. Uh, he's got a. Sl- you, you're playing along at home. Great. Um, so, uh, do you want to run through it, John? Maybe for us then, if you if you can see it there. 
Yeah. Just sure. I, I think you know. I, I think we I just talked briefly about it. Uh, um, uh, we host uh, uh, via Acquia um, on their cloud platform. Uh, we again, we're partners of this uh, internal uh, NBCU team, uh, and they actually manage that relationship for us. Um, uh, so, uh, physical infrastructure that uh, is there, and I, and I have to to say, uh, I came from a, a, a previous role at another media company where we managed our own infrastructure, and uh, uh, you know got very used to, you know, as on an engineering level, being able to get in, make certain kind of changes to your stack. When you move to kind of having this uh, managed infrastructure, uh, it can be kind of jarring, right? You, you, you have to kind of give up some responsibility, uh, some, I would say you have to give up some customizability, uh, but you give up, you give that up and you gain uh, scalability, you gain, uh, uh, basically you gain the ability to walk away from uh, um, uh, issues like running out of CPU and RAM and or whatever, and it just becomes someone else's problem, and that's really nice. Uh, you get used to that pretty quick. Um, uh, then, uh, obviously, we talked about uh, uh, the choice of Drupal. Uh, the really neat thing about MBCU is that uh, we have this Publisher 7 team here. Um, shout out to the Publisher 7 team. Uh, the, uh, uh, what, they are, what they're doing is really they're taking uh, uh, Drupal and building essentially a, a kind of core distribution uh, that all the brands at MBCU can then uh, uh, take advantage of. So they've got a development team. They produce this, this, um, uh, this Drupal distribution, and we get to kind of gain uh, uh, the advantage of, of kind of getting to offload some of the development that we otherwise would have to, um, uh, to do ourselves. Uh, so that's really neat, and then we expect that kind of partnership uh, to grow over time as all these MBCU brands uh, uh, start sharing more code, uh, sharing development cycles uh, with each other. So that's neat. We layer our own customizations on top of that. Uh, again, we talked about Newsvine as a uh, technology stack. Uh, we do some in neat integrations uh, where we're sharing data back and forth between the Drupal stack and the Newsvine stack. Uh, if you look at, uh, at the site and see how it's managed, you'll see uh, groups pages and uh, uh, user pages. Uh, they reside on the MSNBC.com subdomains, uh, and the experience is is very uniform because we share the same. We share the headers and footers uh, out to their uh, uh, to their system, but uh, it's all hosted on a, a completely uh, separate stack. Um, and then we have our video, uh, which uh, uh, we use the platform for video, which is um, uh, a Seattle-based company that uh, a lot of our NBCU uh, partner brands use. Uh, and we have our own uh, uh, kind of user experience built around the, the, uh, the platform's uh, player development kit. So, so uh, UGC here stands for User Generated Content, for anybody that's curious about that. Um, and and just to sort of expand on that a, a bit, uh, so Newsvine is being used for all of the user contributed content, comments, um, any anything along those lines. Right. So you user, wanted, user registration, all that is handled by right. Newsvine. So so although Drupal has that functionality, we're not using that for MSNBC.com. Just wanted to be clear about that with everyone. Um, Karen, you want to talk a little bit about. Um, Publisher 7 and how it was used? Uh, yeah. Um, so, again, as, as John said, we um, the the ONTS team, which stands for Operations and Technical Services. Technical services. I, I knew that. Um, <laughs> uh, but the ONTS team had already uh, started on this uh, Publisher 7, which is a, a distribution. So it's it's a package of, of uh, modules and features and um, functionality that they had already put together for MBCU. Um, they were in the process of building out the, the Drupal 7 version of that when we started on this project, and it wasn't completely ready. So we started with what they had and built on that. And so we kind of built on, we built first on Drupal, and then on top of Drupal we've got the Publisher 7 functionality, and then on top of that we have our own customizations. Uh, and in some cases, we have things that can be contributed back. In some cases, we've got things that are just pretty specific to MSNBC that don't make any sense. Um, but, but we've got all that flexibility. And, and as the project, um, as we got into the project, we um, could identify that you know, we had a need that was likely to be a need that other units at NBC would, would also have. 
and that would be something where maybe this is something that needs to go into the Publisher 7 stack or be, a, you know, an improvement for that or whatever. And then we had other needs that were, very, again, very specific to uh, the particular way that we were rolling this particular project out, and it didn't make any sense. Um, so we, we tried to work with uh, the Pub7 team um, a lot of back and forth on that, and, and they actually got involved in some kind of sub-projects because they were things that had applicability across the, uh, across the rest of the network. All right. Um, I'm aware that we wanted to leave a good amount of time for questions, so I'm going to kind of keep, keep, keep buzzing through. So um, uh, this, this slide has the uh, sort of explanation of the different teams that worked on things and, uh, yeah. and stuff like and that. This is, not, this is like not even beginning to be complete because we – there are so many players on this, in this project and in this process. I just tried to sort of call out some of the key ones. Um, you know, obviously we we had ONTS. We, obviously we had MSNBC and, and their internal resources. We had ONTS, um, a company called Sapient Nitro uh, that was uh, working on the design aspect of building out the designs for the project. We were doing development and, and some of the design work. Um, we had Newsvine for the user-generated content. We had the platform for video content, and then we also had the the video team that. Uh, was available um, on top of the on top of the platform. Um, we had several other Drupal shops were involved. Um, phase two got involved. Uh, we had a group from ThinkDrop that was on the project for a while. We had uh, at least one team member from Chromatic. So we had a number of Drupal shops that were involved in that process. And actually, what I'd like to do, we've got a lot of these people in the audience. Could everybody who had anything to do with the MSNBC project that's sitting in the audience right now stand? Because we, I know we've got. If, yeah, if you're listed on this slide, or you're feeling like internal, you should have been listed on this slide, stand up. <laughs> and and this is not everybody. Obviously, this is just the ones that made it to DrupalCon. So it was a big group. Um, all right. So uh, one of the things uh, that was interesting about this project, as is the case with a lot of the l these large-scale projects that we work on, um, is sort of the communication mechanisms, especially when you're coordinating so, coordinating so many different teams and groups and stuff like that. So um, we've got a slide here that sort of talks a little bit about the different technologies that we used. Um, uh, I guess that there's sort of a larger discussion to be had, sort of in the, in the, not so much the technology, but sort of the methodology and, and sort of techniques. But um, uh, let me just sort of list off here. Uh, we used a lot of teleconference phone lines. That's a sort of a lullabot thing that we do. We, we like telephone lines a lot. Uh, IRC, uh, Internet Relay Chat, um, online chat system. Um, if you're at DrupalCon and not familiar with IRC, by the time you leave here, you will be. Um, uh, email, good old email, um, nice sort of fallback. Um, uh, good place for asynchronous discussions and stuff like that. Join me is a uh, screen sharing um, uh, um, system. Um, Google Hangouts uh, is is popular, but more difficult when you have larger teams uh, or people that are on the road, stuff like that. Um, and then uh, calendaring stuff just to, to make sure um, everybody's in the same place at the same time uh, despite different time zones and, and stuff like that. Did any of you have anything to, to sort of add to um, this communication stuff? Richard's shaking his head here. Um, yeah, look, the, the only way we pulled this off was um, kick-ass project managers. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that. And, and nobody likes project managers. Um, I'm not even sure project managers like project managers. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, from a business point of view, they're the ones telling you uh, you're not going to get what you want. The, obviously, the developers are all being whipped. And so they're always the people that get zeroed out of any discussion, budgets, and everything else. We could not have done any of this, even with all the tools and all the talent and all the smart ideas, without the best project managers on each team, but also centrally pulling the whole thing together. So um, I, I had no idea what they did before <laughs> before I joined this whole thing, and now I'll, I'll set up a, a tabernacle to <laughs> praise them because um, 
you, you just I, I don't know how you get through a complex project like this or anything like it without having you're actually the best people doing project managers as opposed to someone who was an intern six months ago. Especially at this rate, uh, the feeling I had on this project, and, and you guys can chime in, but um, in sort of watching it progress was that basically at any given time there were project managers talking to each other, um, monitoring what was going on, and just a constant discussion of how the development was going to happen, how the, the process was going to happen, um, that was happening always, uh, constantly planning out even what to what to filter down to the developers, when to filter it down to the developers, and that really helped the, the speed and efficiency and ultimately sort of the success and happiness of the project. Um. Yeah, there were there were, I, and I thought of even more things after I put this slide together that weren't on there. But I mean, we did Google Docs and hack pads, you know, to share documentation back and forth, and um, e e email lists. Um, we we uh, ended up doing a, a really simple thing that just helped tremendously. Lullabot had one email list that had. Uh, that would be copied to everybody at Lullabot that was working on the project. And, M and MSNBC had an email list that would be copied to everybody at MSNBC that was working on the project. And so you didn't have to constantly try to figure out, who do I send an email to to hit everybody? You could just hit that list, and everybody got copied. But that was a, a huge issue. Um, but, yeah, all this communication was like you, you have to, like, Bend over backwards. You have to over communicate. You have to communicate till you're sick of communicating, and that's still not enough communication. It's just, it's just so important. Let's uh, let's run through this next slide pretty quick. Yep. But uh, um, the, the some of the tools that we used uh, in particularly in the development process of, of this project. Do you want to hit those quick, Karen? Yeah. Um, the the original idea was we were going to kind of do discussions in um, in um, base camp and figure out what we were going to do. And then once we figured out what we were going to do, we were going to document it as in Confluence as that was the, a, a wiki that was going to be where all the documentation would go. And then GitHub is what we were using for the code repository and then JIRA for the ticketing system. Uh, for the most part, this worked out okay. Ba I think using Basecamp for discussions was a, a fail. Um, we had a million discussions and things kept getting lost in there and all that kind of thing. But the rest of it, it worked out pretty well. And JIRA was enormously... Uh, flexible, and which was really important because we had thousands and thousands of tickets, and we needed a, a good, really complex, really sophisticated ticketing system. Cool. Um, this slide just says goals. <laughs> uh, again, let's let's try to sort of hurry along here, but but let's talk about sort of the ge general goals for the project. I mean. What, where uh, what were, we're we're going to talk a little bit about the timeline, but like kind of what were the um, b business requirements and uh, ultimately sort of creative goals of the project that needed to be hit? Um, well, apart from the obvious one, which was to launch on time and on budget, and that wasn't a small one at all. Um, you know, the goal was to translate this spirit of MSNBC into the digital space um, and, and to to a large degree, reinvent MSNBC. There was no template, although obviously we were working with templates, but there was no, there was no path, there was no map, there was nothing we could copy. Um, and that's why the integrations were really important. It wasn't just that we wanted to have some video there. We were already streaming a lot of, of video, and we, we currently do. We, we stream a pretty close to about a million video streams a day. Um, and people stay with that video for a very long time. So it had to be robust. It had to, the, these integrations, we couldn't just pull out video and say, well, that's the MSNBC experience. We had to have this, um, this connective tissue um, between the video, the text, graphics, photos. We wanted a very strong visual um, identity because we were growing out of a TV brand. So you'll see that right from the home page. And then we wanted to give this room to the, the community space. So, um, and not just as an add-on, but a as the, the infrastructure all the way through. So you would see community at all points. Uh, and one of the best ways to, to understand that is to go to an individual article page where all of those elements come together. The community aspect, the strong visuals, um, embedded video, it, it, it's all there in something that actually is shareable 
um, about 20, 30% of our traffic comes from social media, third party social media platforms. Uh, obviously, mostly Facebook, but um, we know that people are sharing, we're going to share the individual stories and pieces of video. So, business goals were. Um, we're super ambitious. That's all just on the editorial side. We didn't even talk about the integration on the, the pesky ad side, um, which is not a small thing as well. Our, our um, business taskmasters um, want a path to viability. The, the days, although we were, were sort of in a startup mode for a big media brand, which is a bit like the 1990s, it certainly wasn't a business mentality from the 1990s where we could say, you know what, we'll just get eyeballs and figure out the money later. Um, there, there's a strict business plan. Um, the great thing is we actually uh, beat our traffic goals for 2017 in January, uh, three months after launch. So, uh, so this slide shows the original timeline, yeah, which was which encompasses four months. Um, what happened? Oh, is that one for me? <laughs> I thought you were going to explain how how. Uh, so, uh, what happened? Um, uh, we needed time to get our shit together. Um, that's the technical way to explain it. Um, so, we didn't really have. Um, uh, the project defined, um, designs done, <laughs> completed, um, not even substantially, never mind, actually completed, until the May time frame. A and part of that was, uh, which was, I think, initially when we were supposed to launch. So part of that was, um, uh, although we had a a clear sense of our identity and um, and the various elements that we would develop within this digital space. Um, it took us an inordinate amount of time to figure out the decision making structure. Um, getting getting to a a system of decision making at the the editorial brand business level, the real the, the key stakeholders was a challenge. And, um, and what we ended up having to do was have a, a very extensive consultation um, system. So each layer of UX um, went to, I'm going to say, three dozen stakeholders. Um, in the first round, every single one of those three dozen had about 30 comments. Um, I'm happy to say that about the seventh or eighth round, there were only a, you know six people who were still in the conversation. So there was a certain winnowing out, but there was all that expectation built up. Or there was no website. There was, we were creating it from scratch. It had to be ideal. It had to be the best thing ever. Uh, and what, uh, what we had to do at the sort of senior level was um, obviously involve people, get the requirements, the key stakeholders involved – but try to narrow down the decision making, the actual driving force behind the project down to something much more manageable, which really ends up being two, three, four people. Um, so that really, um, that's the sort of high level of why we blew through those initial, um, those initial deadlines. They weren't feasible. Again, this was a group of people who said, don't have a website, how can it take so long? Uh, what is a website anyway? Um, they seem to be, you know, I can click on these things, so how hard can it be? I I'm really not exaggerating a great deal. Um, <laughs> even today, there's still members of my team who think that the system we use is gerbil, not um, Drupal. And um, <laughs> no, that, that's actually true. And um, we just had to do a, um, a, a bunch of presentations to the broader MSNBC audience and uh, explain what uh, CMS is and, and all of these various points of integration, how video gets played and how it's integrated and what this community space is. So the, the education thing is, is really still ongoing, uh, and that's among people who are sophisticated users of the technology, but they have no clue. I guess it's like driving a car. They, they have no clue what's going under the hood and no real interest either. 
So, so we talked about sort of uh, what it took to keep the project on track. I mean, we're talking a little bit about the timelines here, but a big part of it was around the decision-making process and sort of the weighing uh, constantly this process that was going on with the project managers of sort of weighing um, the level of effort of, of a given uh, task versus the importance. Uh, on Lullabot side, um, we've found uh, that we've had the greatest success in, in hiring um, uh, technical project managers, people who are familiar with the inner workings of Drupal um, and are able to, to make estimates based on experience. Um, uh, and, and I think that having being able to have those discussions with the um, more um, – well, less technical. They have other talents, uh, uh, project managers on the on the um, MSNBC side, uh, with m more focus on the uh, understanding the business needs of the project and stuff like that, um, was really uh, helpful and important, um, and ultimately um, pretty efficient. Um, yeah, this whole this whole process. Um, this was a long process. We the, the process of going through the designs. You know, Richard talked about what was going on on the business side, and then once these things would filter down to us, then we had to go through this iterative process of trying to figure out, okay, what does that mean for us? Um, how can we do that? Can we do these things? Do we need to suggest that they change some of this stuff to make it into something that's more feasibly done within a, a, a tight deadline? Um, but it was it was a constant process of. of balancing those things, of trying to say, okay, this is a really important feature. Yes, it's hard, but this one's really, really important to the business. We've got to figure something out, or, or, or not, or, or this is really hard. We're going to have to figure out a way to de-scope it because it's just not going to happen. And, and that, that really was the critical um, point of management, um, these very fluid discussions, very intensive decision-making, and the, and the creative thinking among the developer team about – well, you want this, but if we tweaked it this way, we could get you to where you want to be much quicker. And, and I, I would classify that whole thing as a sort of uh, de-scoping or re-scoping discussion. And that really gained strength as we got um, into the final month or two, where we were just throwing things over the side of the um, air yeah, balloon yeah, to I keep it afloat. Yeah, going to the side of the road really fast in that last <laughs> couple of months. But that, that, was, that was a really critical point of, of the conversation that, that had to go on between the, between the business, the brand, and the, and the developer team, um, really through the project management team. So the timeline got modified, uh, a little bit more realistic, but still being able to meet um, most of the business goals of MSNBC. Um, uh, we decided a, a fair amount of uh, sort of key dates uh, for things. Um, did anybody want to sort of I, chime in on these? One, one thing I wanted to mention that I think is really important is we had a, a time, an original timeline that wasn't realistic, and everybody recognized that it wasn't realistic. And then we had a lot of discussions about how to make a realistic deadline, what, what could be realistic. And the business went back, and, and they came back, and, they, and there was a decision made okay, we're going to move that deadline from May to October. So it, I think it's really critically important to say what didn't happen is we didn't just keep missing the deadline, missing the deadline, missing the deadline. That's not what happened. We reset the deadline once. Everybody understood that wasn't going to happen again. That was a one-time thing. We were all committed to make sure that whatever we did, something was going to get delivered in October, and it was going to be good. Yeah, and, and our our – calculation on that um, our calculation on that was to say um, if we if we extended the timeline how much more would we achieve at, at a certain point you gain momentum and you're heading towards a fixed point and an extra month might not actually achieve a whole lot more there's a quality argument so you don't want to push things to breaking point but um, Having an impossible deadline can encourage people to do really creative, amazing, productive work. Um, so it's a really fine balance there. And, and the, one, the one thing that we did um, which uh, was really important was not to share the ultimate launch date, and not even internally. Um, we, we had an idea, a window, but we didn't say internally, never mind externally, we will go public with this thing at this point um, because that would have led to 
a, a really distorted view of what was a, a very fine judgment call about how hard could we push the team, how fast could we do this. Um, we knew we wanted to we wanted to hit this calendar year of of, um, of thirteen, um, and we you know. Ideally, the, the joint venture deal had, had been unwound in, in July, so we were trying to be closer to July than to December. Um, and so it wasn't that much more sophisticated than, than finding a midpoint between the two. But keeping it out of the public eye and keeping internal expectations um, to a relatively low level was, was really important. And it launched. <laughs> Ta da! Um, I'm going to switch over to questions if anybody has any. There's a microphone up here. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, we're happy to answer them or we'll just continue to talk amongst ourselves. We, I skipped over a whole bunch of slides, so um, I can go back and cover various things. But, um, but I'm sure we've left you with some questions. I have a lot. <laughs> go, go right ahead. There's no one behind you. <laughs> I'll just do two. Thank you so much for your presentation. But um, how much user testing do you guys do with your um, editorial team? I'm sorry, how much testing? User testing. User oh, testing. user testing. With the editorial team. With the editorial team. Um, sort of back end. Not enough. Um, <laughs> how much user testing did we do? Um, there was extensive discussion about what they wanted, what they needed. Um, uh, Karen, in particular, was leading that, so she can she can talk through some of that. We um, uh, we didn't have a whole lot of time built in to to do the kind of testing everyone wanted to do because it was so rushed. This was, you know, final designs in May and launch in October. That that gives you a sense of. We tried to get some feedback going, but I'll be honest with you, that that all got compressed, and that that's user testing in terms of actual users as well as editorial? Yeah, the, the, the whole process of dealing with the editorial process, um, obviously you can't create an editorial process until everything's in place, you know, everything's built. Uh, you, you can't say how are, how are the editors going to create these things until the things are created. So by definition, that has to come really late in the process and that means we don't have a lot of time. There's nothing you can do about it. We had a lot of conversations with the editorial team about what was good enough for launch, mm -hmm. you know, okay, what was really horrible about the experience? We, we tried to fix the really horrible things. We tried to get as good as we could get on the rest of it. And that led to my second question. How much of the editorial workflow is actually integrated with CMS? Do they start with a lead and it's all in the CMS or is it taken from Word or some other platform and then? Um, so writers don't trust any CMS. Um, they just don't. Um, so they will still um, cut and paste things and then have all sorts of horrible formatting questions, uh, at least for the, for the copy and home page editors. Um, once it's in the editor's hands, it, 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 all, it all stays there. So there are a couple of brave writers who do trust the CMS to, to not erase all their work. Um, uh, video's a whole different workflow, so that's that's... Uh, m vastly more complicated. Um, the I, I will say that we just to pick up on the last question as well. It, it's been very iterative. We keep improving the editorial tools. You know, even as we speak, there are people working on improvements to the editorial tools. Um, the editorial team really wants to be able to track content much better than we currently do. That's that's um, that's still a challenge for us, and that's something we're working on. But. There's, there's pretty much every week discussions about how we can simplify workflow, streamline it, improve it. Uh, photos in particular, we, we are a heavy consumer of photos, and that's, um, that's a challenge with all the breakpoints and the recropping and everything else. Um, maybe it's a different discussion or an offline thing, but like for photos, uh, how much control is that given to the editor or the person who posts the stories online? Is it separate? We, we have photo editor team. Um, we don't let the writers do anything but write. <laughs> <laughs> and that's hard enough, believe me. So photo, the photo editors really control this, and they're very um, precise about what crops they want and where, as photo editors should be. 
And from a technology standpoint, that actually, um, that kind of division of labor uh, presents some issues which we're trying to figure out how do we solve uh, uh, a photo team that has the rights to do certain things and, uh, and, and make changes, let's say, to a, uh, to a home page independent of the story editor and, and how do you kind of keep that, um, uh, 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 make, create a good workflow where, where those editors aren't colliding with each other. Um, so that's something we're, you know, trying to figure out. And I see our developer team over there going, yeah, yeah we're going to get it. It's a really interesting workflow. I mean, for, you know, most of us are familiar with, like, a blog <laughs> where it's just you. Uh, this is a whole different kind of workflow where you have, uh, you know, multiple people on different teams working on it. We've got a few people lined up uh, for questions now, so let's... Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, two quick questions. First one is what discussions, if any, took place to identify functionality differences between your native app and your mobile website? And then the second one is I saw uh, data up there for design freeze. Did you approach the project methodology here using waterfall as opposed to agile, and why? Thanks. The project manager is actually sitting right there, so um, she could talk about the, the, the philosophy that we used. Um, uh, first question was... Uh, Oh, app, the app question, yes. Uh, so the app we have currently, the MSNBC app, which is the first ever MSNBC app, was really courtesy of um, the NBC Universal um, partnership. It, it's, um, it, it's a sort of placeholder for us. It's a really elegant placeholder, but it's really driven by the video experience. Um, we'll be um, launching our own native app in iOS and Android later this year, fingers crossed. Um, so what was the discussion around that? You know, part of, part of the, the idea of having a really responsive site was so that you could have the full experience in the, in the mobile browser. Um, that was absolutely central to the strategy. Um, I think that we, looking back, believed that the mobile browsing consumption patterns would, would grow more strongly across the board for all publishers than they have. In fact, all the data I've seen shows app consumption growing, so that really does push us into having a much more robust app strategy. And our, our guiding principle at this early stage is really that um, you can do everything in the browser, so actually apps shouldn't be that. You shouldn't be doing everything in an app. It needs to have a, a different prioritization structure and different features and functions. And I think the mistake of a lot of publishers in the app space is to just repeat everything they can do in the browser, in which case, what's the point? Jen, did you want to deal with the uh, waterfall question? Um, <laughs> so I, I actually came onto the project in June after the design freeze. So I was kind of in a interesting position because we had designs and then a tech team that didn't know quite what to do with the design. And um, a lot of folks were kind of frustrated that they felt that a waterfall approach had been taken. Um, and actually, my, my mentor was the one who came in and helped define the decision-making structure. And I don't like putting labels on it, but uh, the first thing, kind of the, the methodology we went with is first to find the who, to find the team. That decision-making structure had been set up when I came in, so that was fantastic. And then there's really just the three what we call cogs of project management, right? Scope, schedule, budget. And that's it. Whatever way works, um, we had really, really great technical PMs who were familiar with the Agile methodology, um, and they knew how to run their technical teams, so I relied on them for their technical expertise to run their teams. The problem is we had 10 development teams. <laughs> so um, it really was about kind of, I guess you could call it Agile because it was self-managing teams, um, but that's really what we had, but it was... I'm not going to say we use Waterfall or Agile, but what we did was set up a roadmap from June to October. And every two-week sprint had a theme. And it was, we're going to get as much done as we can on this specific area, and if it doesn't get done, then it needs to be good enough, and we're going to move on. Because if we don't move on, we won't get to launch. Um, so it was very, uh, I think what led to the success from a PM perspective was also that we had complete support from our senior management team in terms of that de-scoping, re-scoping, um, letting the teams kind of take full ownership of what they had to deliver and not tying them to a very specific design. Um, but does that answer the question? 
Sorry. Okay. I think we're only going to have time for one more question, uh, so that we'll we'll uh, you guys can fight it out. Oh, look at that! Wow. <laughs> That was an uh, interesting right. move there. Right on. Did you pay him money to get a cut in line? I like it. I don't know. I, I mean, I heard you earlier, John, talk about um, Drupal being a solution where you could customize the content types for kind of the future of news and the way stories evolve. That being said, um, there have been a lot of new kind of news sites like Vox Media, BuzzFeed, very social heavy as you talked about the social integrations. Um, so it's interesting to hear you guys talk about Drupal being able to meet that when we see sites like BuzzFeed and Vox Media saying we have to build our own um, system to handle this. So the question is, what sites are in your that you would find MSNBC comparative to? Mm -hmm. And do you feel like you're, with Drupal, abreast of kind of the trends that, they're, that these other companies are trying to tackle? Do you, See yourself in that that kind of echelon of those sites. That's a you, that's a great one to finish with. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I mean that's a that's a super broad question. I think Richard could probably better talk about uh, what sites uh, what he thinks we compete with. Um, I guess if in a general sense you think, um, and that's a great question about uh, you know there was a whole uh, a series of, of discussions happening on the internet recently uh, about CMS as competitive advantage that uh, you know some of these sites were talking about. Oh well, the reason Business Insider or the reason that uh, uh, BuzzFeed is successful is that they develop their own technology, and um, you know, I think we could have a, a session about that question entirely. I think I fall on the side of that uh, um, if we were a uh, VC-backed, uh, uh, funded organization that had the kind of uh, money that BuzzFeed was backed with, then uh, creating a custom uh, built from scratch CMS might be an option. But, um, you know, honestly, for for our organization uh, and budget-wise, it's, it's an impossibility. It's unrealistic to think that we could have gone out and created uh, a custom CMS uh, from scratch. And I would say that Drupal is probably the next be uh, best thing to that, right? It's a framework for building a, r a relatively custom application. Um, and I think, you know, in our case, um, really kind of a no-brainer. Um, uh, the competitor set is huge. Um, it, it's everything from CNN.com, you know, a giant portal era news site through to a small progressive site like uh, Talking Points Memo. I mean, it's 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 a giant area, and, and pretty much every place you can <coughs> you can watch video, um, including YouTube. So it, the the competitive set is enormous. I have to say, uh, we've looked very closely at all of the claims people are making about their custom built um, uh, CMSs. We actually just met with Vox Media. I'm I'm a huge fan of of what they and BuzzFeed do. I do not believe, however, um, in spite of their press releases and their press coverage, that um, their CMSs are, in fact, the secret source, no matter what they believe. I think the culture of, of development and very close alignment of editorial and the developer teams, I think that is the secret source. So they may express that culture by saying they've got this kick-ass CMS. Um, at what point is your CMS the advantage, or is it your listicle of cat videos? I mean, you know, it, it could be that the cat videos are actually really popular, and the CMS is, is a marginal um, influence at best. So I, I do think the culture of innovation, of, of design that really has a purpose of knowing your audience and knowing your brand and having technology that can serve that, that is what matters. And... Um, I, I like I said, we sat down with the Vox folks. They made those claims. We pressed them up. Like, what? What exactly is it that you, makes you so happy with this thing? And it turns out it's having the editorial leader sitting at the same desk with a project manager uh, who can then pass on the editorial needs and desires directly to a small, fast-moving design development team that can get things done in a very compressed time frame. That could happen for us if we were set up like that. Uh, sometimes it does. Sometimes our projects are more ambitious. Um, it doesn't always happen like that for Vox. I, 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 just, I, I still don't believe that it's really their custom-built CMS. I think it's a philosophy. 
Great. So uh, just the, the tag on here, um, Lullabot is hiring. Uh, we work on awesome projects like this and have others and uh, are looking for great people. MSNBC is also hiring. Um, Lullabot.com slash jobs uh, or find John. Find me. We, uh, we're always looking for great developers, especially if you're a front-end architect and you're looking for it. Please, please speak to us immediately. Also, uh, uh, I put about 30 pounds of weight in my suitcase that has... Oh, uh, we've got uh, swag. MSNBC.com bags. I have Rachel Maddow cocktail shakers, which... Uh, uh, are, you love you it. Enjoy yourself at home. So uh, on, if you asked a question, be sure to come up, um, and uh, and then we'll have stuff le- left Get over after gift. we give, yep. give stuff to those people. Uh, also, Lullabot has a, has a booth uh, in the expo, the exhibit hall, um, stop by if you've got more questions about the project or would like to find out more about uh, what we're hiring for. So, thanks everybody. Uh, enjoy your DrupalCon. You.